So welcome along. This is our first show in a little bit of a mini landscape photography series running through September and a bit of October. I'm going to be joined by our wonderful, I say resident landscape photographer, Mr. Chris Sale, over the next few episodes as we chat about landscape photography. So welcome along, Chris. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very, very much. So we've Good. got we've got like a little mini series, as I was saying, about landscape photography that we're going to be chatting about, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. We've got, uh, I think we're doing four podcasts over the coming month. Indeed, yes. So if you're listening and you like landscape photography, then this is the first instalment of our little mini series. So make sure you keep listening for the, the next few episodes, because this is all effectively to celebrate the upcoming release. Or if you are listening to this, maybe like a month or two time, it's to celebrate the full release of now that our landscape photography course is out. And this is all fronted by Chris. This is all written, designed um, by himself. And I say these podcasts are going to get a little bit more information as to the insights of a landscape photographer what it's like interesting ideas that you can do etc cetera, etc cetera. but today specifically we're talking about the lifestyle of a pro landscape photographer and obviously no better person to get than yourself Chris but but just just for those that are listening for those that anyone that hasn't jumped into a podcast before because I think we were just saying this is the first podcast that you've done with us it's um it's give us a little bit of a bio uh, a little bit of background about me. So uh, I'm Chris Sale and I am a professional landscape photographer. I'm based in the Lake District National Park here in the northwest of England. Uh, I've been a professional for about uh, two years and uh, I, I predominantly spend most of my time uh, teaching other people about how to take uh, better landscape uh, photographs and, and to enjoy their landscape photography a lot more and I do all of that exclusively here in the Lake District which is one of the pre, uh, premier uh, locations for landscape photography I would say in the UK if not Europe. Well yeah I was going to go further and almost say the world really because I, I suppose we can be a little bit biased obviously being being in England etc and yes. you know it's being in the Northwest, you know, it, it's one place that you'll go a lot kind of if you live in this region, but certainly just, you know, looking outside, I, I've been to places, I've been abroad, etc. I mean, have you found anywhere that's ever you felt competed with the landscape and, uh, you know, with the Lake District in terms of beauty and views, etc. anywhere else in the world that has caught your heart? The world is, a, the world is an amazing place and there are beautiful landscapes all over the world. But personally, for me, I have a very deep connection with the Lake District and that's what drives my photography. And I really don't travel well. And it's not because I don't appreciate the rest of the world. It's that I'm just so much in love with this landscape here. Oh, bless. Well, there you go. <laughs> See? So if, you, if you're not living in the UK, you need to move to, to Lake District, Chris is saying. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm absolutely not saying that. But, um, but I do think it's very important for you to have that relationship with the landscape that we have. And, you know, it's, it's very common place these days to see lots of landscapers traveling all over the world visiting all these wonderful exotic locations Iceland, Patagonia, um, uh, the Faroe Islands these sorts of things um, but that's not what we all do and some of us are very much dedicated to a single location a single landscape. And that's interesting, actually, because it, it pretty much forms the basis of my first question that I had about lifestyles or perceived lifestyles, I suppose, of a, of a pro landscape, because me, I, you know, I, I, I like taking a landscape photo. It's not the it's not the kind of the heart of what I do. Um, but, you know, from where any, you know, prior to meeting yourself, the thing that I knew about landscape photographers, I learned a lot from YouTube. And I imagine a lot of other people had done as well in terms of just understanding what their day to day life is like. Like, but like you said, I, I don't necessarily think that's a realistic expectation or, you know, it's not something that everybody will, you know, every pro landscape photographer will go through because it can look like it's very, very glamorous walking along the black sand beaches of Iceland and jetting off to South America and, and Africa and, and taking some amazing photographs. But, you know, it, it's it's all very, very well and good that. But what is the truth? You know, you know, if you could kind of boil it down a little bit into kind of a, a couple of sentences. What's the truth of it being like as a pro landscape photographer, Chris? It's nothing like what you see on YouTube. I think <laughs> the danger with, with social media is, of course, that what you're seeing is a, is a version of the truth. Um, and in reality, it's, there's a lot more drudgery to it. Um, there's a, I, you know, as, as a professional landscape photographer, I spend an awful lot of time sat at my computer. 
Um, and you know, social media is is a is a window into what it's like, but it is an exaggeration. Uh, yeah. what what it's like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, again, I don't know many pro landscape photographers, but I can't imagine many that are jetting off all over the world. Obviously, I you know, understand that the, the benefit of a big YouTube following and a channel and et cetera kind of helps with that. But, you know, for the people that aren't really kind of doing not to say those people are doing it for YouTube necessarily, but the people that are doing it for followers, et cetera, if you were just teaching you know or you're, you're doing workshops etc on the whole you probably wouldn't be float, flying around the world mostly do people tend to stay in their own country you know uh, landscape photographers do you find primarily they they base themselves in one area or they travel a little bit i i think that i think the the majority of landscape photographers and the majority of professional landscape photographers that i know um you know they do travel um, a lot. I think it's, that's definitely the attraction to a lot of people. Mm. But um, I think that you don't have to to, to travel um, to be a landscape photographer. And I know very some some very successful landscape photographers who base themselves you know, not even in national parks like, as I have done, um, but are actually photographing the landscape that's very close to them. Mm. And then I think it's a very very personal uh, a very personal thing. Um, so I do know that some of the some of the we talk about YouTubers, we talk about some of the big YouTubers, uh, YouTubers with with large followings. They're very much uh, into landscape photography, and it's become very much their passion because of the element of travel and going to exploring the world and seeing new locations and things like that. And that's the great thing about photography. It's the great thing about landscape photography is it really does give you that opportunity and it kind of pushes you, it it encourages you uh, for making the effort to go to these places, going at the right time of year, going at the right time of day. And I think that's a big thing, but it's not, that's not what drives all of us. And I travel, I don't travel at all, but well, I don't travel for talk for photography at all. Um, and my relationship is with with the landscape that that inspires me. Um, I'm, I'm very much a, a Lake District landscape photographer. I, I wonder where the line blurs between that being landscape photography and travel photography. Um, you know, wh- whether it it becomes more about the travel than the landscape. It's interesting that you're saying that you know having that connection to a location you know one specific location and maybe a couple um you find anyway that that kind of creates a better image or a more thought out image i just wonder whether you know that the rest is done i don't know really what i'm getting getting towards with this that it's it's just the enjoyment of travel and photography happens to be a byproduct along that line is that more Mm. travel photography than what you see as you know, more hardcore landscape photography? I think sometimes when we look at kind of genres of photography, it's difficult to define what the boundaries are, and there are always overlaps between different genres. But for me, travel photography personally is a lot more about culture and the culture of a particular country, and I think it involves a lot more um, photographing people. Whereas traditionally landscape photography focuses just on that, on, on the landscape. And, you know, you look at um, a lot of the, the, a lot of the work, the, the landscape, great landscape photography work over the years. And I think it's, you go from image to image, it's very unusual to see people in that. And um, it's becoming a little bit more fashionable with social media influencers and the, uh, <laughs> the old uh, Instagram yellow jacket at the bottom of a wall. <laughs> oh, we've all seen those photographs. But... Uh, I think just, traditionally, just, just shoving my yellow jacket under my <laughs> table. No. Not having, I'm not having a pop. I'm just making an observation. Um, but I, I do think that I think that's often the the distinction between those two genres. Yeah. Um, and I, I know I appreciate travel photography and I and, and that sort of thing. And I, and I like to look at you know other cultures and to see these sort of things. But my photography has always been driven by that love of the Lake District. In fact, my love of the Lake District came before my love of photography. It's that yeah. way around. So, well, that, that's kind of quite an interesting way for, for people maybe to assess themselves, really, the thinking about, you know, getting into landscape photography a little bit more, et cetera, that it's maybe, you know, you, you've got the views and you've got the places on your doorstep, like you're saying, you may not have to be going far, you know, you don't have to go to, mm. you know, far off countries, et cetera, to be kind of capturing great images if you actually understand the environment around you. That's, that's a very, very good point. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And it, it is obviously 
harder in different parts of the world and there is less opportunity to shoot the big vistas and sort of the landscapes that we have here in the land in the lake district but you know big vistas and and, and wide shots that's only part of landscape photography and you know there's a great opportunity where it got regardless of where you are in the world to to photograph the landscape even if it's on a smaller scale in yeah. a more intimate way yeah well, hopefully, if uh, if anybody's listening to these podcasts before previously, the they'll be very very rehearsed with me going off on a tangent a lot of the time because I want to kind of come <laughs> back exactly to what we were meant to be talking about. <laughs> Coming away from YouTube slightly, we'll come back to that in another episode, I'm sure. But coming back onto the topic of of, of lifestyle itself, that you know, with making that change, you know, what did you find were the biggest changes or the biggest hurdles that you needed to get over? kind of compared to when you were working, say like we call it a nine to five life. And you know, how did you deal with that, that kind of change a little bit? And there was those hurdles that you, you had to face. For me, the biggest change when I went from my previous life in corporate IT to being a photographer, a landscape photographer, who were, you know, the vast majority of us are self-employed was just that it was, it was, it was running the business. And there's a couple of things that really stand out you have to be incredibly disciplined because you are the boss. You don't answer to anybody anymore. Mm. Um, so, you know, you have to be disciplined because it's very easy to be sidetracked and to go and do things that perhaps you shouldn't. And we all have to do things that we don't want to do, even though I'm doing the dream job for many people. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a great love of mine. I still have to do, things like marketing and I still have to do things like accounts and you know, all these sort of things that we don't want to do, you know, making podcasts, that sort of thing. <laughs> all right, Chris, <laughs> 15 minutes in, you want to wrap it up already? <laughs> no, problem I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but well, I mean, that's, that's so true because that again, you know, it, it really does nicely roll into the, to the next question I've got is what does a typical day look like for you? You, you know, it, it, it sounds, as I say, it sounds the dream job to, to go out and be photographing or to be a photographer full time. But what, again, you know, is the reality of it. When you wake up in the morning, how does your day plan out? I, th I think the, really, the thing that really is, is good from, from my point of view is that there isn't any such thing as a typical day. It's very, very varied. But I, my days tend to have a structure. I typically will shoot in the morning. I will um, typically go out with a camera first thing. I'm, I'm out for sunrise. Um, and then I like to try and get back home uh, into the office for about nine o'clock. And then I will do a full day in the office. And that can be very varied as well. Um, so, you know, I'd spend a lot of time. I, obviously, I, I do YouTube, so I spend a lot of time um, creating videos, but I also write and I spend some time writing. But then there's all that kind of marketing thing. Um, you know, I have you know, managing clients and managing workshops and that kind of thing. And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in that, um, you know, so, you know, it, it is relatively varied. So, for example, you know, this week I'm, I'm uh, to, to this evening, this afternoon, we're, we're recording these podcasts. Uh, tomorrow I've got to write um, an article. Uh, on Friday I have a, a, you know, another series of client meetings. So I help photographers all over the world. And so I will be working with some photographers in the US at the end of the week. So it is, it is very varied, but I do sometimes feel I sw I've switched one desk job for another at times. It's a bit, <laughs> a bit like that. Well, well, actually, that, that again, you know, it gives me the opportunity to ask, given all the, the business requirements, obviously, as you are self-employed, you, you, you are running a business and mm. photography just happens to be the, the, uh, the point of that business. But as a landscape photographer, how much of your typical week, let's say, is actually spent taking photographs? If you could break it down to a percentage or you know, how many hours in a week you actually spend behind that camera? So I will shoot, I will shoot, shoot between four and five times a week, four or five mornings. I'll typically be out for, for five, four or five hours at a time. So I'm probably out shooting for 20 hours, 20 to 25 hours a week. And then on top of that, I will have uh, typically six days in the office, eight hours a day. Oh my word! So yeah, uh, when you really if, add if, up the numbers, yeah. So it's a, it's a, so it's a twelve. I mean, twelve hour days is a, a typical. Sixteen, eighteen hour days are not unusual. Uh, weekends, 
they're a thing of the past. That we've so seen. that's like that's like sixty hours a week, and you know, given a corporate life, let's say, and I appreciate sometimes the higher up the chain that you go, you know, it, it's not so much forty hours anymore. But in comparison, are you working more hours than you used to? Would you? Say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt. And but the thing is, they, they you know they they kind of say, don't they, that. Um, if you do what you love, if you can find out what you love and do that, then you never work a day the rest of your life. Yeah, 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 you're right. And it's not a job. And But the, I, I, I'm sure there is bits that people wouldn't enjoy when they're self-employed. Maybe it is like, you know, all the, the tax bits, et cetera, all your VAT yeah. returns, et cetera, those bits that, that are a little bit much boring. But obviously there's, there's got to be kind of positives to it, which I'm sure we'll, we'll kind of come to shortly. But it would kind of be remiss of me to kind of ask a little bit, really, that... You know, obviously you've been doing this for kind of quite a number of years and obviously there's a lot of other landscape photographers out there that have been doing their job for quite a while. So it leads me to believe, obviously, there's money to be made out of it. But mm -hmm. has it become harder? You know, is is it not to say is it worth the money because you don't necessarily go into it for the money? I appreciate it's 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 the love of what you do. But have you found it kind of get harder and harder kind of for, for making money? Or do you believe that, you know, there's scope for more and more people in the industry to come in? It's very difficult for me to answer that question because I've only been a professional for two years. And obviously, during that time, um, you know, we've been dominated by the, the coronavirus pandemic. And I've actually worked out for a quarter of my time as a professional landscape photographer, I've actually been locked down. <laughs> wow. you know, which is, you know, so, so it's very difficult for me to answer that question. I do know that there are um, many landscape photographers who make a very good living. Hmm. Um, it, you know, because it is um, you know, you're self-employed and there's that entrepreneurial side to it, then you know you can earn more than perhaps you might be able to do in a nine-to-five office job. But you have to be very good and you have to work incredibly hard. Hmm. Um, the competition comes from the fact that it is seen as being a very attractive way of life. Um, but the reality of that is, of course that um, it's not perhaps as as, as romantic a, a job as people would first see it. Yeah. And yes, there are many advantages. I, you know, I get to spend a lot of my working time in a beautiful part of the world doing something that I absolutely love. But, you know, you do have to work incredibly hard and, you know, you do have to do a lot of the, the, the drudgery that goes along with any business. So, mm. you know, it's and, horses for courses. And do you find that there is a particular or maybe particular traits in a personality that is, you know, those types of people that are more suited to landscape photography or, you know, are, are, are stronger or more successful in landscape photography. Do you have to be a more resilient, more driven, as you say, because there is a lot of, you know, groundwork that needs to be done that sometimes isn't that most attractive. You know, you've, you've got to accept that there's a business aspect and it's not just all about photography, but because obviously I'm sure there's a lot of people that fail, unfortunately, you know, trying to be a, a landscape photographer or just a photographer in any genre. Yeah. I mean, so I think, I think, I think it's important to make the distinction between a successful landscape photographer and a successful professional landscape photographer. And if you look at many of the best landscape photographers in the UK, at least, uh, and the guys that are winning landscape photographer of the year, many of those are amateurs. Um, and you can be a very, very, very good, very, very, very successful uh, landscape photographer as an amateur. You don't have to make it your job. Mm -hmm. um, but as a professional, it is all about being able to, to, to make a living from that. Um, and I think that that requires a different set of skills. And I almost put the, the ability to take great photographs and, and the, the being a brilliant photographer, I actually put that be behind being a good businessman and being having an entrepreneurial flair. The, the important thing to, to, to talk about with regard to professional landscape photography is this need for us to develop multiple income streams. Um, it's bad business sense to try to rely on a single income stream. And I made the mistake when I first started, I was very successful with one to one workshops. Um, and through the through the following that I had in YouTube, I, I picked up a lot of bookings very, very quickly. And I decided that that's what I was going to focus on. And then, of course, the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit and I lost my entire business overnight. 
Um, and so you have to have many strings to your bow. And so you have to have that entrepreneurial flair. Um, again, just like any business is about providing services that people want, uh, having uh, differentiating yourself from your competitors and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think in order to, a great landscape photographer doesn't make a good professional. And, um, you know, I think entrepreneurial flair or whatever it is, you know, is very important. And then along with the, you know, it is hard and you do have to work very hard. So, you know, you have to be very determined. Um, by the very nature of, of photography these days, it's very dominated by social media. Social media isn't always a pleasant place to be. Mm-hmm. You have to be very resilient to criticism. And we, we are, thought, to all intents and purposes, talking about an art form here. And Despite the subjective nature of, of art, you will still be told on a regular basis that you're not good <laughs> enough to do this. And, and, oh, and yes. so you have to have a thick skin. Yeah. And, I, and I've, I, that's something I've learned. You know, that's been... That's did you tough. did you oh, I was going to say yeah I mean is that something you've you've just had to kind of deal with or did it something that you kind of built up that thick skin you know just through your life anyway you know your previous life etc you were kind of I'll say used to it because no one should really have to get used to things like that but is it just something you, you that's kind of your personality already you know you can brush things off fairly easily I, th- I think that um so to answer, to answer the question no I mean it was something that I wasn't prepared for um i think you know it's worth pointing out that i i probably wasn't a, i wasn't a brilliant photographer when i made the switch and and making becoming full time was a big part of that was to allow myself the time uh, to get out and shoot more and to become the photographer that i thought i had the potential to become and i'm you know d- despite what's gone on i'm i'm happy very happy with the progress that I've made in that respect. Um, but, you know, so in those early days, you know, you get a lot of, I got a lot of comments and I got a lot of criticism and people saying that I wasn't good enough and, and that sort of thing. And that's one of those things that I think just comes with time and comes with experience. There's always a bit of a shock when it first happens um, because, you know, I mean, I would never, I would never openly criticize any, anybody else or anybody else's art particularly. Um, I might not like it myself, but I would never express that and particularly not express it in an, an aggressive way as, as has been done to me at times. Um, and so it's always a shock when that happens to you. But that is the nature of, of the game. That is the nature of social media. Yeah. And the thing is, the great thing is, is you become more confident in, in your abilities and you start to produce work that you're happy with. The minute you start to produce work that you are happy with, that you can put your hand on your heart and say that represents what I want to say, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Mm. Dan, that's, that's lovely. I think that's a great way to, to wrap on that one. Cause it's, yeah, you're right. You know, we, nobody gets into photography to have a big following or make loads of money. I should say, you know, there, there are a small amount that do, um, mm-hmm. but we do it because we, we love it as a hobby, really. It's like, I imagine, well, I'd like to think, I imagine how footballers kind of get into it. You just start as a kid, you're playing, and then it just happens to develop, but you still love the reason why you got into it. And it's, it's a massive shame that as much as a social media has a great positive effect and it can lead on to brilliant things, it comes with that kind of horrible, you know, detrimental side sometimes, you know, those, those comments, et cetera. Yeah. And it's sometimes you know, almost impossible to avoid, no, no matter how good you are, that I imagine even, I always think to myself, if Ansel Adams, you know, one of the, what people revere is probably one of the greatest landscape photographers views on social media, he'd still get crap for something, wouldn't he? Oh, absolutely, wouldn't and you see it. You see it. I see it today. You see it with um, so one of my great heroes in landscape photography is Charlie Waite. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charlie Waite is um, you know a British landscape photographer. He's probably the most one of the most preeminent photographers of his generation, particularly here in the UK. He started Landscape Photographer of the Year. He started the Light and Land Company that do lots of photographic tours. Incredibly well respected and a very very nice fellow, and I see him getting criticised on social media. Yeah. And, it, and I think once you realise that, you stop worrying too much about it. Yeah. Because if it doesn't matter, you. I think a lot of people kind of use it as, um, or, or try to use it as as motivation to get better. And I will show you. But yeah. You will never ever. You. It's the subjective nature of photography means that somebody is always yeah. going to dislike what you do. And unfortunately, 
um, there are those of them that are prepared to, to, to voice that opinion and, and they don't necessarily do it in a kind and thoughtful way. Indeed, yeah. I, I, I always see it as, you know, if people are really criticising you and trying to tear you down, then generally you're going in the right direction because those people effectively are jealous. That, that's how I see it, is that they don't like to see others um, you know, make money or make a living or do what they want to be doing, but because they can't do it, that you know, they're not actually able to, that you know, they're, they're living somebody worse, we're living somebody else's dream, um, that they're just gonna, you know, do the only thing that they can and be a bit of a keyboard warrior, really. So, yeah, we, we see it every now and again, and it's and it's sad and it's shameful that that's you know, the way that sometimes the, the world goes a little bit, really. But it's, 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 as you say, you know, having that thick skin, I think, is, is an important thing for people to realize, you know, how they've they've got to deal with it but i imagine you know to make this a much more kind of positive experience <laughs> there is a lot more positivity so i was kind of skipping down a little bit that you know what would you say is the best experience that you've had that makes this lifestyle worthwhile is there one particular moment or, or event that ever happened to you that you thought not yeah. not, not 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 one particular thing but the, t- teaching is is incredibly rewarding um and you know, if you're able to take somebody to a beautiful location and you're able to show them a technique or uh, explain something to them in a way that, that's, that the penny drops and, or, you know, or they have a revelation or something like that, that makes a difference to them and makes a difference to their photography, then that's a really special moment. I think for me, for, you know, my belief is that photography is, is the, the best way to spend your time. If you, you know, if you want a hobby, photography is the, is the best way of doing it. And you, 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 you know, it's an incredibly pleasurable experience, but there's nothing, there's nothing quite like being able to get good photos. So if you're in the, if you're in that position where you're able to get photographs that you're happy with on a consistent and regular basis, then I think that that's, a really special thing and being able to impart what I've learned and help other people get to that level more quickly is very, very special. I particularly think of a client that I had who I started to work with last year and he got interested in photography or, or more serious about photography during lockdown. And he came to me in the summer and we went out and we had a one-to-one and I started to teach him some very basic um, camera techniques and camera operation. Um, and I was able to teach him how to, you know, the workflow that you go through when you're taking a landscape photograph. One of the one of the first things that we cover in the course, um, because good good landscape photographs, good photographs of any description are always built upon that foundation of good camera technique. And so I was able to teach him that. And so the the second time he returned um, earlier this year, um, we didn't have to worry about camera technique he was able to focus on composition and expressing the way that he saw the landscape and he in the in the time between me seeing him for the first time and then the second time he had become a photographer there was no question that that's what he was Mm. and you know that's a special moment when you give photography is a gift and in in if a blessing And, and and if if you can bring somebody else into that and help them to, to develop that passion, I think that's, that's incredibly special. That's lovely. And it, and it is, it's a teaching experience that you offer and you know, that we, we do as well that, yeah, I, I fully agree that the thing that makes it all the worthwhile when you see people grow um, and they appreciate that growth and they, they understand, you know, what you've been able to, to, to give to them, you know, and, and, and so those, that knowledge that you've been able to pass on and share, because it will only make photographers better you know as as we go through life that you know the more that people want to learn in a certain way whether it's through courses or or kind of um live tutoring etc mm. but if we can make beginners better then it, it it benefits the whole industry and it lifts everybody up a level in so many different ways so it's it's so nice that that people appreciate it and like you know like with your client that you know transition from being a novice to what you as a professional would, would say as a photographer uh, in fairly short space of time really in what yeah. like a what a few months or a year was it yes yeah, so it was it was about it was just under a year it was between yeah. the, the two times and of course we were you know locked down for, for a big chunk of that yeah 
Indeed. Well, that's brilliant. Well, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for on this show today, but it's not the only uh, show that we've got with Chris. If you listen to our uh, future episodes that we've got coming up, or if you're catching this uh, a few months down the line, you should be able to kind of hear them all already. Uh, we've got tons more chat about landscape photography we've got coming up, Chris. Um, and obviously, if anybody's got any questions for us, you can kind of send them all in. Um, just email them at tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. Um, you'll have a link in the description to get our I get sign up to our VIP list for the landscape course. Or again, if this is a few months down the line, it should just go to the course itself and you can join that up. Um, you can obviously find us across all the normal social media, but Chris, you'll be able to find Chris online as well. And your, is your Instagram or your, your YouTube, but they tend to be, which is the most popular for you. Um, you're probably YouTube, but well, both really. Um, but yeah, I'm Chris, Chris sale photo on both of those. And my website is chrissale.co.uk. There we go. Sale as in 70% off, not a boat sale. As in jumble. Jumble. <laughs> Chris which, Jumble Sale. Which was, was, my nick, <laughs> was my nickname at school, yeah. Chris is also like seven foot two, so I think a bit more yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris, um, for, for this podcast. That's brilliant. Um, and yeah, as I catch all the future episodes, um, you know, kind of coming up in the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about more landscape photography. So we'll move on for now. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.